She's not what you'd expect. She's tough and feisty, but gentle and tender. She makes millions and gives millions to the poor. She cries, she laughs, she teaches, she comforts. This is the Danny Johnson Show. Hi. All right, let's talk building a team and this entire process and how it works. I just had the employers standing up and really what they're looking for are team players. And a team player cares about the overall health of the organization. They care about the win of the organization. But sadly, most players on the team only care about themselves. They only care about their score, their personal shots, their personal blocks, and that's it. They don't look at the whole big picture. So if we looked at the whole team, if you want your business to grow, you want your organization to grow, your church to grow, largely there's skill sets that are missing as to why it's not growing. In fact, lots of studies have been done on this. Uh, in fact, Dun & Bradstreet uh, put out a statement that 90% of all businesses fail within the first five years, and it's because of the lack of skill by the owner. So the owner doesn't know how to do a few things. It could be accounting, largely not, but mostly has to do with how do I recruit the right people, whether it's the client or the staff. Two different types of recruiting that has to be going on all the time, all the time, because there is attrition. You will lose customers and you will lose employees. Every organization loses customers and loses employees. Did you hear me? Every organization loses customers and loses employees. No organization, every church loses members and loses employees. So there's the very few that stick with an organization for a long time. Same with any kind of foundation or charity. Doesn't matter what the organization is, people move in and they move out. Um, the higher the skill of the owner, the better the attrition numbers are. The lower the skill, higher attrition. Attrition means you're losing people. So in my professional opinion, these four areas, actually I would say five, these five areas are really important for growth. And I wanna put a focus we're gonna skip talking about the presentation. There is a system that we have, it's two hours of training, specific training, scripting, called Presentation Success System. You might wanna own that. You might wanna study that. If for job interviews, that kind of a presentation would be job domination from both sides. How do I interview somebody and how do I get interviewed properly? So from both sides, you're gonna see it on job domination. So that's a two-hour training. We're not gonna talk about that right now. A lot of your presentations are already fixed for you, meaning it's a recorded call or it could be a video presentation, uh, could be a one-on-one -on -one presentation. There's 10 very important steps inside of this. I'll give you one, is build me twos. So if I'm looking for investors, my first a uh, few minutes is forming that investor. If I'm looking for a distributor for my wallpaper, my first, sorry, I'm looking for something, and I don't see it. My first, um, where are you? Help me, help me. There we go, got it. Okay, so my first thing is I'm going to form them, and in that forming, I'm looking for how I'm gonna build my introduction. And my introduction has to create me twos. I'm not looking to be better than who I'm presenting to, I'm looking for us to have a bridge built between the two of us. So the introduction needs to have a bridge, it's not I'm better than you, um, it's not you're better than me, it's, we have, there's some common ground between uh, the two of us. Number two, you're gonna present what your industry is, which is presenting a problem. So in the case with the filmmaker, 
uh, he better give some demographics as to what the problem is, as to what your films are pointed to, and who is not feeding that need. And what will be the result if that generation is not, uh, if that generation does not know how valuable they are. So I will tell you that initially, and this is why I was saying I was pressing you about your why, because what it sounds like is you sound like a victim of the generation, that you're one of the victims in the generation whining and crying that we're not important enough and all of you older people think you're much more important than we are. So believe it or not, that's how your presentation came across. So really what it sounds like is a, a, young, a bunch of young people whining that they think they're more valuable than really what they are. And we wanna be known just because we're on the planet. That doesn't, that doesn't hit an investor. That doesn't make me want to invest into that um, at all. But if you get to know who the investor is and perhaps even what they think about that generation, the problems perhaps they see from their perspective, right? Because it's an older person, right? So you've been on the planet twice as long as I have, perhaps. I would like to know what you've watched happen in our society, what the results have been, and what you see for the future. They're walking right into your presentation. Does that make sense? Versus coming from your, you, you were coming from the position of the whining. I know you can't see that right now, but you're coming from the, hey, we have been ignored. We've been misjudged. We need to know who we are. It doesn't make anybody want to invest into that kind of an idea or that project. But if you hit up the investors with, hey, I want to learn from you. You've been on the planet longer than I have. You obviously are incredibly successful. You see a lot of things. You've watched the market. You've watched people. Um, that's probably how you've become really successful. I want to get your assessment about what you see in the next generation, what you see for the future, what you see the differences are. They're going to tell you. And then that's what you set your presentation up for. Because that's something they know. That's what they can identify with. You say, man, I agree with you. Don't look to argue with them. Look to learn from them. And what they, that, in other words, that's a deal with the sign, the form and the sign. So you know, you're getting their perspective and their position. They will invest in their position of what they know. Do you hear me? Listen to me. Investors invest in what they know. Investors invest in what they know. Good investors. Anyone with $10 million invests in what they know. <laughs> they don't invest in what they don't know. Okay, so you're looking to build the me too. So I just told you how to do that. So in that particular forming example, that if I'm looking for an investor to, to do in my films, if I'm leading with what I think it should be, I'm missing the boat altogether. Yeah. Okay. okay, so but if I am... Uh, forming them and finding out what they know about this particular industry, what they think. And, and, it, and it's not even necessarily an industry. And then you come prepared, packed with statistics, right? Um, what, the, what the problem is. Again, you have to create the problem before you give a solution. And get good at presenting that problem. So if you bring some industry facts... Okay, for example, in my old presentations, it was that the, uh, uh, the weight loss industry was a $33 billion industry expected to double inside of the next 10 years to a $66 billion industry, which shows that there's a lot of opportunity. There's $33 billion that someone is going to grab. The question is whether or not that's going to be you, right? So that was a projection. Here's the problem. One out of two people are overweight. One out of three are obese, this is an epidemic, and it has to be fixed, which creates a lot of opportunity for investors to see that the industry is going in the right direction. There's a lot of profits and money for somebody to grab because this trend is not turning around, and it's actually going in the wrong direction. So it's whether or not you want to capitalize from a $33 billion surge that's going to be entering the marketplace. Okay, so number two is present the problem. Number three is present the solution. So in this case, it's his film project. In Jama's case, it is her wallpaper uh, design work. Um, in my case, with the weight loss industry, um, the, it was the product, the weight loss product that we had to answer the $33 billion need that hasn't been answered yet. And so when you present your product, you must present uh, results. 
Results, do not get deep into your product. Don't get into the nuts and bolts of your product. Don't get into the features of your product. You wanna sell the benefits. What sells the benefits the most are the testimonials. Stories is what sells the benefits. And so, Travis, I think I heard you say um, yesterday that you had just done a film with my friend Kevin Sorbo. You have his personal phone number? You do not. I do. <laughs> I'll let him know I met you. <laughs> his cousin actually has been faithful to these events for the last 10 years. Um, yeah, pretty funny. Anyway, she has an amazing story. She paid off over $200,000 worth of debt and saved her marriage and a bunch of other kind of stuff. Anyway, so... Um, there's a reason why I asked you that. Okay, so features versus benefits. You said that you'd worked on a, on a film with Kevin Sorbo, right? So have you, so I'm assuming, I could be wrong, but have you ever had an investor partner up with you for another film? You haven't. Okay, cool. Um, so because you don't have a personal story of a personal film that you've produced and your investor made X amount of dollars, right? So then what would be your next option? Because if it's about, okay, if I'm going to present my, my product, and again, your product should be presented wrapped around their beliefs about your idea, not your beliefs about your idea. Do you understand? And largely, there's probably a lot of bridges. Now, I'm, I'm going to throw something at you very interesting. I am, please do not misinterpret my words. Don't think I'm saying something that I'm not saying. But yesterday, and I want to challenge you. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm a coach. And a coach challenges you to the point of maybe throwing up. A good coach will make you throw up. Seriously. Make you so uncomfortable. Why? Because a coach sees in you potential you cannot see yourself. There's things in you you cannot see from your perspective. Let me, let me prove this very simply to you. Hold up your hands. Put your hands where you can see them. Can you see your hands? Now I want you to pull them back to where you can't see them. Does it mean they're not there? Your hands are still there even though you can't see them. But guess who can see them? I can. So I remember playing basketball. I played basketball for 15 years. I started when I was six years old. And I remember somewhere in my high school years where the coach would be screaming from the bench, get your hands up. Who played basketball? Get your hands up. Why were they saying that? If you're on defense, I thought, I'm like, my hands are up. Like every time they'd be screaming that, my response, they're up. And he's like, get your hands up. Why? I'm much taller with my hands up than if they're down here. Do you understand? But to me, my hands are up. If I'm on defense, I'm, my hands are up. No, but what he can see is that they are not up higher. Okay, same when I played volleyball. I got to play on um, uh, an A-league team, the best team in the state of California. And that coach made me puke several times, running bleachers, up and down, up and down during the conditioning stage. And this is actually how he picked his team, who quit, who wouldn't keep going, who wouldn't go to the top, who wouldn't give it their best. Those people got cut. So this is my first time on that team. I ran my butt off off those bleachers in bed the next morning, screaming, Mom! Couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't move. So she literally flipped me on the floor. <laughs> you land on your hands and knees and then you gotta, you gotta get yourself up, right? So anyway, a good coach is gonna see what you're not doing and point out what you're not doing. If you don't have somebody like that in your life, you're not even touching close to your potential because you can't see whether or not your arms are up higher. So when I'm talking about this coach, this volleyball coach, he saw in me the ability to jump higher than I thought I could. So he forced me. So for blocking a, a spike, right? So for blocking, get your feet off the ground. Get, get your feet off the ground. I'm like, I am. Get your feet off the ground. It's like, I can only jump so high. I can only jump so high. Well, I'm gonna tell you, but I, could, I wish I brought the picture with me actually. I, I can show you a picture where I am so far off the ground and the net is here. Right here. When I started, huh, tink, this was it. Here. Just from what? Him pressing. Bleachers, suicide lines, bleachers, suicide lines. 
get your feet off the ground, get your feet off the ground, put your elbow above that net. I'm like, hello, I'm only five foot tall, five foot eight. Some of my other teammates, you're six foot tall. Sally, Sally, Sally Stevenson, some of you know my old, old uh, classmate, Roy and Sally, they, they're graduates multiple times over here. But love her, right. Sally is like six foot tall. It, Sally can stand at the net, go like this, and it's right here. <laughs> Okay, I'm four inches shorter than her. This is, her and I both play on the same team. So he saw a higher jump in me that I could not see. Why? I can't see my hands. I can't see how, fat, how far up my feet are coming off the ground. Can I? No. But can he? Yes. So listen to me. If you want the fullness of your dormant potential to come alive. You gotta put yourself in position with someone that is going to call you out on your excuses. I'm not kidding you, because if you don't, you stay low. You stay jumping two inches off the ground versus six or 12. So do you have any idea what potential is inside of you? So this is why I'm being hard on you. You have a big dream, Travis. And your biggest challenge, and this goes for the rest of you that have his personality, and some of you know who you are. You're super driven. You go to the top. You're constantly running. You're going to make it happen. It's lead, follower, get the out of my way. Okay, you have an intense drive. Your biggest challenge is you think you're working at your best all the time, and you ain't. You haven't even come close. The other thing is you think you already know how to do it and know the process because you were given an overdose of confidence when you were born. <laughs> but you haven't even come close to tapping your potential. So it would be best, and it's not just that personality, same with all of you who have my personality where you know, you're very detail-oriented, you're very organized, you, you make sure and do all your research, that's me. Love routines and schedules. That's me. That's you. You would love my closet. <laughs> the wrong thing about my personality and his personality is I am fully researched. Therefore, I know the answer. No, I only know what I can see. I don't know what I cannot see. So the best position for you to be in if you identify with either one of these personalities is to assume you know nothing. To assume that your best is just getting started, it's nowhere near its potential. To assume that when somebody says to you, I had somebody, Cindy, where are you, Davidson? Okay, you said, man, why is correction so painful? I want you to flip it and get on the other side. Welcome it. Look for it. Don't stay away from correction. He who loves correction is wise. He who hates correction is stupid. So this is a beautiful strategy. And the strategy is I'm looking for where I'm weak. I'm not looking for where I'm strong. I'm looking for where I'm weak. I'm looking for where I can get better. So whatever it is that you think you know, that's the first thing that you say, I know nothing. I know nothing. I want to know what I don't know. I want to learn what I don't know how to do. Okay. So flip it around, like correction, it's like, thank you, tell me more, give me more, give me more. Why? Because it's that place. When we defend where we're being corrected, we're not growing. We're not growing when we defend, when we defend our position, we cannot be healed and we cannot grow. We cannot, we cannot see because we're not even looking to see of what that person is saying or what he is saying is real. Yeah. So it's literally, when, so, when someone points something out to you, you're blinding yourself on purpose. Uh, why do you feel crushed? Why, why do you feel crushed? I failed. Look at this, because your identity is wrapped up in doing right. I'm going to say this again. So she says, I feel crushed when I get corrected. Why do you feel crushed? Why, I feel like I failed. Because that's a performance-based identity. So you were raised in a home that if you got good grades, you were a good girl. You got bad grades, you're a bad girl. 
That's performance-based acceptance. Therefore, your identity says, if I perform good, I'm good. If I screw up, I'm bad. That's not what he says. That's not what he says. He's the one who wrote, he who loves correction is wise. He who hates correction is stupid. We have so much potential. You see, it's our modern day church world that puts everything down to black and white. The Bible is filled with gray. So which is why I'm challenging Travis right now. Thank you, Lord, for saying this. Remember you said there was a man from the porn industry that wanted to invest in your film? You see, and you said God told me no. I'm going to challenge you right there. I'm almost twice your age, and what I can tell you is there's a lot of things that I journaled that I thought God told me to do or that he said to yes to or no to, and I'm telling you, I was flat out wrong, and I was hearing my own self. And when you have programs in your head that this is black and this is white, okay, when you have this black and white world that, that you live in and you add our black and white religion to the equation, now it is, oh, his money's dirty money, but how do you know that God didn't want to clean that money by bringing it through a film that would change lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? How do you know that he didn't want to clean that money? Think about it. Think about it. Do you, ha- you need spirit-driven success. You need to get a hold of that whole training series. There's two uh, sets of audio libraries that go with it and the book. Okay, It's really, really powerful to help cleanse your mind of some of the very limited poverty uh, mentality that has come from our religious world that is not biblical, clearly just not biblical. And so one of those things is, is that we, you and I are supposed to compete head to head in the marketplace with the heathen who is still his child. So ha, ha, what determines that they're a heathen? Tell me, brother, from your religious mind, tell me, you know the answer. Oh, cause he doesn't go to church. You know, and in our minds, a heathen is someone that doesn't walk with God. Not saved. N- not saved. What's that? Don't even get me down that rabbit hole. Because <laughs> that's a whole nother. That's, a, that's, by the way, a modern day. You're not going to find that. That's a modern day campaign. Yeah. Go read your Bible. <laughs> yeah. And what determines whether or not someone is saved? We're not going here right now. (laughs) We'll be here till midnight on this one thing right here. Okay? So anyway, I'm starting to sweat. (sighs) Okay. So watch. So I believe that we as believers, as children of God, we're supposed to compete head to head in the marketplace. Okay? Um, I understand finances. I understand the kingdom of heaven and how the kingdom of heaven's, I understand it too, like this much, um, how the finances work over there. And so if my heart is to make money so I could bring it to my king and I've been trusted with it, he says 10% straight off the top goes straight to his work. (gasps) What's his work? Giving it to the church? No, the church actually didn't exist in the Bible. Certainly didn't exist where the tithe was taught and where the tithe was given. There There was no building. The tithe actually went to the Levites and Aaron. There's only one priest line, and it's Aaron. It's not your pastor. <laughs> the word pastor doesn't even exist in the Aramaic. It doesn't exist anywhere in the Hebrew. That word that, that the Greeks translated of Paul's writings, as some are called to be pastors, evangelists, the five-fold ministry, which, by the way, does not exist in the Bible. That term, five-fold ministry, is not in the Bible. What else is not in the Bible is communion. That's not in the Bible. There is not even a salvation prayer in the Bible. Doesn't exist. These are all campaigns made by man. Every single one of them are campaigns made by man, okay? Go read the book. You're like, you're screwing up my entire life right now. (laughs) No, maybe you put yourself in a little cage that you feel really comfortable in. God is in your little box with you. Maybe he's much bigger than you think. Maybe he's much, much bigger than you think. Maybe he's more than what you've been taught. We in our modern day world have separated him out of our everyday lives and we put him on Sunday only. Unless you're a seven day Adventist and he's on Saturday. Okay, so so to compete head to head in the marketplace, so you have to think, who would he tend to want to give the money to? Someone who's gonna be responsible with the money or someone who's gonna be foolish with the money? Someone that's going to be responsible, right? And so the tithe was given to the Levites. The Levites were supposed to take care of the Levites and the poor and the widow and the sick. 
There was no big giant $17 million church building or $1 million church building. There was not a television ministry that we're gonna spend $90 million a year to run and to fund and not feed the poor, not free the kids out of the sex trade, not take care of the widow. The tithe was all pointed straight to taking care of the poor. So if I'm gonna compete head to head with my competitors in the marketplace, okay, I know that he will bless me because I am trusted because I take care of the poor. And he says that if whatever I lend to them, he lends to me, that he will be my rear guard, he'll be my banner before me if I take care of the poor. That he'll open doors for me that no man can shut, that's all part of it. So therefore, I'm not intimidated by my competitors and nor do I see their money as dirty money. What I see is their money as a flow through because here's what it says, is that the, the wealth of the wicked will be transferred to the righteous, but let's go here, let's go here, let's go here. According to, according to the parable, sorry, according to the parable of the talents, the one who took the money that they were giving to be an investor, by the way, the parable of talents is about investment. Five talents to one, two to another, one to another. So the one took the talent and he what? Buried it. What did you do with your five? Come on. We talked about you burying your talents yesterday. He buried it. He was called a wicked, lazy servant. Send him out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So laziness is wickedness. Someone who is afraid to become an investor is wickedness. Someone who is not making money from their money is called a wicked, lazy servant. He says, you should have put it at least with the bankers. I would have at least collected interest on what I gave you. So this person from the porn industry is where I'm pressing against. I want you to press against your religious belief and back them up with your biblical beliefs. Do you understand? Because religious beliefs and biblical beliefs are very different. They are literally as night is different today. So read the Bible cover to cover. And you will find a lot of the stuff that's in your head doesn't exist in the book. Seriously. So here, if that man comes from the porn industry, 20 years ago, I saw it the way you did. Today, as I've walked with him, I'm like... Man, that was a religious judgment. I'm better than you. Your money's dirty. My money's clean. Versus, wow, that money, what is this man who makes millions of dollars by selling pornography, which I am not for, selling pornography, what is he going to do with that money? Make more pornography. And what else is he going to do with the money? Probably lavish himself in lots of pleasures, right? Lavish himself in Bentleys and private jets and all that kind of stuff. He's going to have a very lavish lifestyle and he's going to invest it into more pornography. Could it be that God brought you this guy so that a portion of that money could end up redeemed? Redeemed. So it's the same as how we see like a Daniel, right? Have you ever studied Daniel? A bit. Do you know who he was? Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel. Daniel, you got it. (laughs) It's okay. Okay, so Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel. Daniel worked for an idolatrous king, actually three of them, okay? And in our world today, he would be called wicked because he's working for that man who, who worships idols, Daniel, you need to serve God. You need to serve God, duh. Which means you need to quit your job, and you need to work for the church. Am I lying or dying? You need to quit your job because that man worships idol. Guess Guess what Daniel's job was? His job was managing those who practice witchcraft. That was his job, man. He managed those that did seances, conjured up the dead, spiritists, medians. He managed, his job was managing those who practice witchcraft. So tell me today, in our religious mind, what would we tell Daniel? You're going to hell if you don't get out of that job. You're not serving God, working for that guy. Heathen, right? But who put him there? 
God put him there. God put him there. And what did he use him for? Oh, he redeemed it. How? That king and the other two ended up worshiping God. Because Daniel, hello, where was his faith? His faith was in him. His faith was in him. His life was actually in jeopardy three times. But he refused to not follow him. Make sense? Same with Joseph. In Potiphar's house, they worshiped false gods. And Joseph had to manage those people. Make sense? So we got to get out of our Sunday school version of the Bible and read the whole book. It's a giant business book. All right? So again, I'm going to challenge. Every time you think God's talking to you, I want you to press against that and say, you know what? This is, you want to hear my confession before my God? I'm dumb and you know it. You also know that I have a huge ego. You also know that there is pride and arrogance in me. But here's what I know about you. You woke up a man named Joseph and you told him in a dream to take him and his wife Mary out of where they were and get over to Egypt. So if you have the ability to, to wake someone up, I know you can wake me up. That if I'm about to step into some caca, I'm pretty sure that if you don't want me to, you have the ability to stop me. That if you can part the Red Sea, that if you can send three wise men to come and find this little baby off in some manger someplace, that if you can bring water from a rock, I am pretty sure if you could actually lead two million people with a cloud by night, I mean by day and a pillar of fire by night, I'm pretty sure you can get me the message. So if I'm about to go in the wrong direction, it's your fault. (laughs) Because you said that if I put my trust in you and not in myself, but in all my ways I acknowledge you, I'm acknowledging you, you will direct my path, which means my very next step is directed by you. You also said that man makes plans in his heart, but you direct his steps. I know you're not a liar. I know I have lied. (laughs) So I'm acknowledging you. I've got a plan in my heart. You said make my plans plain, write them down and present them to you. And you're the one that brings success to the plans. That's all. That's my prayer. I'm about to make a big decision. Yo, dude. (laughs) Dad, help, Abba, Abba, you know, you know how many screw-ups I've had. Now check it out. This is where some of your Sunday school screws you up, screws you up so bad. Well, I I prayed. I, I did that, Danny, and I ended up in a big pile of poop. Hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. Because in your Sunday school mind, Mm -hmm. that if I'm perfect, and if I hear God, he will only lead me to good things. Okay, so there is Joseph, (laughs) who has a vision of the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. And he also has the sheaths bowing down to him. And then he finds himself in a pit. His brother's trying to kill him, selling him off to Egypt. And for 33 years, he serves a wicked people. And what does he say at the end of the story? That wasn't you that sent me here. It was God. God sent me here so that I may save the remnant of the people of Israel. So in our Sunday school mind, in our performance-based acceptance society, especially our performance-based acceptance religion, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. What happens when you do good, get bad? So if I do good and I get bad, oh, I did something wrong. I suck. God doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me. He's not for me. No, he is. Wait, what about Jonah, who is a prophet? He gets swallowed by a fish to be spat out. You're going to listen now? Get over there. What about Daniel? What about Job? Job, where the Bible is clear. Consider my servant 
Job, he is blameless in my sight. He is a righteous man. Oh, <laughs> let's beat the crap out of him. <laughs> Do you understand? Our little Sunday school mind traps us and leads us to the wrong places. And what, we do, what do we do? We stay away from the fiery furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into. Wow. Wow. We stay away from the lion's den. And we say, well, God must not want me to do that. <laughs> Took these four guys that were blameless, really good looking, really fit, really healthy. You're like, nah, Danny, the Bible actually says that. That the four of them were great looking, they were fit, they were healthy, better looking than everybody else. And smarter. They were smarter than everybody else in Israel at that time. Pick them and put them where? Fiery furnace, lion's den. <laughs> Do you understand? So don't be afraid to walk through the fiery furnace. Don't be afraid to walk to that lion's den. Don't be afraid to serve the wicked king. Don't be afraid to be around the idolatrous people. That's exactly where we're supposed to be. That's exactly where we're supposed to be. But our little Sunday school life, oh, I got to stay away from those people. I can't associate with them. You've just limited your market and you just limited your God. Okay? All right. 